is what exactly is art? Because as engineers, we're used to technical definitions of things and rights and wrongs, and, and art just doesn't fit in. What appeals to us as human beings? What design sells and what doesn't sell? That's one basic question all engineers tend to ask. And, and, and I'm lucky I'm in the company of a lot of designers. And all designers tend to have this question, will my technology succeed? Will my technology fail? So to answer that question, one very interesting research was done by a scientist. Uh, this bird here is the Atlantic puffin. It's a very, very interesting bird with a very colorful beak. And what scientists did, <clears throat> uh, OK, what the puffin does is it goes out to the sea, catches fish, brings it back, back to its nest. What scientists did was they re replicated a pattern out of the beak. You know, they just sort of made two strips. And they showed this pattern to chicks, puffin chicks. And puffin chicks got really excited because they associated this pattern with food. And what they did next was something more interesting. They extrapolated the pattern. This pattern is not present in reality. You know, it's an extrapolated pattern. But when they showed it to puffin chicks, they got even more excited. This is the scientific definition of design. This is the scientific definition of art. Art is an extrapolation of your basic human instincts. And what are our basic human instincts? Survival, reproduction, that's it. And when you look at, well, I assume you're smarter than uh, puffin chicks. Let's talk of cavemen. The first form of art, what was it about? Hunting. Hunting, food, basic human needs. And, um, and interestingly, some cave art that, that is present in history is an extrapolation of that. You know, more food. I don't think this is possible unless they had McDonald's back then, which I assume they didn't. But you can understand why these images were considered as the most beautiful images to cavemen. Because it reflected their need and ex extrapolated their need. And how art developed is it developed into something like this. Because our needs changed. You know, our basic human instinct change. And you see the extrapolation, the exaggeration. It's the exaggeration of the mind. It's the exaggeration of the art. This is a very famous uh, painting by Saad Khan. And this is about life. And in his end years, he painted about death. And this is what he painted. Please notice the skin tone here. And we're going to have this in discussion later on. The art that human beings did and the design human beings did became more complex, so complex that it's not easily discernible into its basic design elements. But the basic design elements remain the same, life, death. OK, because that's what our environment looks like. Before I talk about anything else, I have to talk about my washing machine. I have a wallpaper of this washing machine on my desktop. This is the most amazing washing machine ever. Washes 250 clothes per, per cycle, dries them. It's beautiful. I have a wallpaper on my desktop. I have a poster on my wall. Do I sound weird? <laughs> a little, yes. I know, I'm not an idiot. I know I sound weird. But I'd sound perfectly OK if this was my wallpaper. Both are machines. The first one washes your laundry, and the second one transports you from A to B. But what is it about this machine that, that gives me a bigger emotional connection? Or let's, let's rephrase it. What is it about this design that gives me a bigger emotional connection that makes me want to spend more, and that gives me a sense of self-esteem like no other machine does? Sorry? Yes, symbolism of what? 
because this machine has been anthropomorphized. That's a new term. Anthropomorphized means giving it human features, human traits. And it has been systematically anthropomorphized by a lot of research, years of research, and years of, years of trial and error. And the automobile industry, design is design. Everywhere design is design. But the automobile industry has systematically understood the deepest recess of human psychology, and they've designed things accordingly. Every curve that comes out is either male, female. Every car, if you've noticed, has an age. Not physical age, you know, has an emotional age, design age. I mean, there are not, not the model. You look at some certain cars and they're infants, and you look at certain cars and they're adults, and they're big burly adults, because they distort the proportions accordingly. And every car has a gender. There are some female cars, and there are male cars. And then every car has an expression. You know, you must have noticed some cars frowning at you. That's by design because somebody down there understood what product psychology was and what consumer psychology was and interpreted it. And you must, must have noticed expressions on cars. And then let's talk of one of the most iconic designs in history, the Coca-Cola bottle. Why was it so immensely successful? It was not because of product superiority. It was because the shape and the design coherence. You know, it's like, it's like a female figure. And that's, and female figure in red, it's about youth and energy. And that's what made it so successful. But this design, although it was successful, is drafted by this design. In 1981, Volkswagen rolled out the 20 millionth Volkswagen Beetle in Mexico. 20 million vehicles. And the interesting part is it's been, what, 80 years since this design has been in existence and it hasn't changed much. In fact, it hasn't changed at all. This is the new Beetle, 2017. Almost looks the same, except that we've got plastic bumpers. Do you know who designed it? The guy who designed it was an absolute genius. Do you know who designed it? Somebody very famous. <laughs> Yes, Hitler designed it. And we all know Hitler to be a terribly evil, megalomaniacal man. But in fact, what Hitler was, was a genius of design. And he was probably the best designer this century has ever known. And it's up, it came in 2000 and, and beyond that people have unearthed what he did with that way. This is Hitler with the vehicle, and these are the sketches actually done by Hitler. And this was uh, a vehicle called Porsche Type 42, which was designed by Ferdinand Porsche. Ferdinand Porsche was also the design engineer of the Volkswagen. And uh, Volkswagen was, was the symbol of Nazi revolution. It was the symbol of the working class. And when the war ended, Everything that was German was hated. Do you know of a dog called German Shepherd? That had to be rebranded as an Alsatian because anything German would not sell in UK and the US. But everybody loved the Volkswagen. And when it came to talking about the Volkswagen, they say, okay, yeah, Nazis are bad, but leave the Volkswagen out of this, as if leave the children out of this. And you know why? Nobody figured it out. Back then, nobody knew why Volkswagen was such a resounding success as compared to its predecessor. And Hitler not only designed the Volkswagen, he also had grand architectural drawings. And he designed his own emblem. And it symbolized it, a lot of things. And he even designed himself what we know as design peacocking. You could draw Hitler out as an instantly recognizable figure in four lines. Just draw the mustache, and you know it's Hitler. He, that was his iconic rise to popularity. And even his salute, you know. We had this yoga session. We had our hands like this. When you shake hands with somebody, please notice the verticality. That's body languages. 
the upward your hand is, the more submissive you are. The downward your hand is, the more dominant you are. Hitler gave out sheer dominance. People would have laughed if he had hands like this. OK, so nobody figured out what he did in that design of the Volkswagen. This design came out in 1970s. This is another very famous design. It's called the Mini. And this was an immensely popular design. And this came out by accident, too. And nobody figured out what was you know, the key to success behind this design. Was it performance? Was it better engines? Was it the transverse mounted front engine drive? Or was it something else? And in 2000, scientists began researching on this fact. And you know what they found out? What Hitler had done, had, he had distorted the proportion of its predecessor car and made it into a smiling infant. People love the Volkswagen, you know, and that's, they love it because, because it's an infant and who could hate a child? And then scientists began systematically, you know, demorphizing and morphizing car faces into making them into giving them a certain age and giving them a certain gender. By the way, I have a quiz for you. Can you recognize the owner of this car? Who do you think the owner is? This is another very interesting research on car psychology, uh, which was done somewhere around 2005. And what they did is they, uh, they took out pictures of cars and their owners, and they put out six potential owners. And they asked people to match them. Who thinks this is the owner? Nobody? This? Yes. Possible? This? Okay. This guy? Yes. And this guy? Yes. No? No, this girl, sorry. Okay. This guy is the, the owner. There was a non zero or non random probability in this room that you found out who the owner was. Because what you did subconsciously, you looked at the eye region of this car and you match the eye region of the owner. People tend to buy cars that look like themselves. They tend to buy products that look like themselves or say something about their personality. And not only that, people tend to buy dogs that look like them. So if you want to know somebody's, you know, somebody, somebody's personality types, just ask them, Who's your, what's your favorite dog? And you'll get a very interesting answer. And in, when it comes to products, this is obvious. I mean, we can make out a female form here, and we can make out a posture here, and, and we can make out an emotional expression. It does say something to you, and it does specify a certain amount of arrogance or self-confidence, because you can make out the posture. But where do you see anthropomorphism in more mundane objects? Does this give out an emotional feel to you? Or do you notice something about this vehicle? It's relaxed. Hmm? It's relaxed? Why do you say that? It's a chair. What else? Minimalistic. Calm. Tell me about the human emotions in this. Hmm? Lazy. Lazy, calm, relaxed. Chilled out. Soft. Soft. Why? Why do you say all this? Yeah, but why do you give out all these emotional responses? This is a non-living thing. What about this chair? Who are these people? Who are these people? These two people. Friends? A couple? OK, they're the opposite gender, but you know, best friends. Lovers. Who's in for best friends or fun friends? And who's in for lovers? OK. Not for lovers? OK, best fun friends. It's a chair. Who do you think these people are? Friends? Colleagues? OK. Why did you say colleagues? Because what you did is you noticed the shoulders. And everybody's shoulders 
are pointing towards the same direction, and then they've got feet that are not pointing anywhere in anybody in particular. They're pointing just generally in the same direction. Might be friends, colleagues, is more possible because, because they're pointing towards the same direction, same goals. What about these guys? Can you identify the couple? And who's the engineer? <laughs> yeah, story of our lives. <laughs> okay, uh, because he's carrying a laptop. You know, that's why he's the engineer. But how did you figure that out? Because what you did, you've noticed the, the sway of the shoulders. And what you've noticed is you've noticed the direction of where the feet are pointing. And what you've, who are these guys? Couple, Couple husband and wife? Because, because they're standing in close proximity, pointing towards each other, the shoulders move towards each other. They've got a very similar expression, probably been married for a long time. You figured this thing, you figured it out subconsciously. You use the same subconscious methodology when it comes to analyzing and giving an emotional response to, to non-human things, such as graphic design, such as furniture. What you noticed was the direction of the shoulders. The shoulders point out towards each other. But they've got these arm cro arms crossed, probably best friends. Good design, bad design. Good design? What do you think? Not in terms of functionality, I love for distribution. Yes. It, it does put a smile on your face. I mean, if you look at this design, it does trigger an emotional response. So it's a good design in that sense, but it wouldn't sell. Because there's, I wouldn't buy it because I have nobody to sit with. <laughs> okay. And that's what you do while, while analyzing any design. What do you think of this design? What about the user who uses this design? CEO, CEO you know, somebody with a lot of ego, a lot of stature. Uh, because what you've noticed is you've noticed the size of the shoulders, you know, big shoulders, as if he, he thinks he carries the world on those shoulders. That's not metaphorically speaking. And, and then it comes to placing the product. Once you place the product, you place or market pricing of the product, you price it according to, according to its design in the social, uh, in design hierarchy in the society. So coming back to this design, yes. And what you also noticed was, was this particular color. You know why this color is so common and we see it everywhere in furniture, everywhere. Why? It's neutral? No? Okay. Hmm? Yes, it, it's skin color, and it reminds people of human skin tone. But you have to be, when you're designing things on human skin tone, you have to be very, very, very careful. Because slight changes in skin tone give out slight, you know, totally different emotions. And what this skin tone, and, uh, and its usage on a scientific basis came out of car design as well. And we're going to talk about more on that. First, I'm going to show you this very, very famous picture, study of Picasso. This study, what Picasso did was he deconstructed the bull into simpler and simpler lines, such that he could maintain the essence of the bull in about four basic lines. And this is what the design philosophy, this picture is the official design philosophy of Apple. Do you see relaxed shoulders when you see an iPhone? You know, Mark Zuckerberg's shoulders. It's not a suited, booted man. It's not stiff. It's just a well-rounded shoulder. That's what gives you an emotional response or the emotional response you think you get by looking at an iPhone. Okay, when we talk about how does death come in? 
You know, this is about life and design psychology. And the opposite is the fear of death. In 1960s, in America, what people started doing is they started buying Jeeps, post-war era, post-war Jeeps. Started buying a lot of them. And, and these people, the typical consumer of, of a Jeep, had nothing to do with war. He had nothing to do with uh, going outdoors or going to the mountains. He'd use it for the city, but he'd still own a Jeep. So what General Motors did, they, they hired a team of psychologists and they asked them to to do a psychoanalysis on, on the consumers. And you know what they found out? They found out that these were people who were going through some patch of insecurity in their life. And it was the fear of death and the fear of losing that was forcing them to buy a more aggressively looking vehicle. And then they did some more research and they said, okay, you want a Jeep. What expression do you think the Jeep should have to the outside world. And you know what they, they said? This is what a modern day SUV looks like. Aggressive, looking down. A Jeep could be smiling, but that's what they didn't want. And the second question was, how do you want an SUV to look on the inside? Or how do you want your insecure vehicle that goes along, you know, telling your insecurity to the world, how do you want it to look on the inside? And they wanted everything round, flush, curvy, not functional, nothing rough about it. In fact, they wanted a trim that reminded them of their mother's embrace or their mother's warm or their mother's skin. And these sounds then became engineered because the consumers, they wanted, they wanted their vehicles to sound on the outside on a very low, aggressive octave level. They wanted it to sound like this. And on the inside, they wanted the exact opposite. They wanted white noise. Do you know what white noise is? It's noise like this. Because that noise is the noise you hear when you're inside your mother's womb. It's the noise of blood circulation. So that's how the SUV became the SUV became one third of America's market and F-140 Ford became the largest selling truck in the world because they played around the fear of death. Talking of skin tones, have you seen this skin tone somewhere? In human form, have you seen it somewhere? Where? No, it's not a cheetah, it's a human skin tone. It's a human tone, I mean, and I'm sure you, you must have seen it somewhere. I've seen it here. Right. Strength, you know, power, aggression. And that's what they wanted the skin tone of this car to be. Vacations, life, live in la vida loca. And Interestingly, in wrestling, they use the other skin tone to signify death and to instill the fear of death in opponents. This wrestler, in particular, by design, was called The Undertaker. And this is probably the, the type of car he'd drive. You know, that is what design is. It's, everything is biologically trapped between your own basic human instincts of survival and death. And we come to the very interesting case of our local design, the truck, the rocket. And we started researching on this topic and, and it was baffling to us as engineers, why would somebody buy a truck like this for six lakhs, spend 12 lakhs of decoration on it, which had no functional value. And these truck owners are not, are, are not the bigger fish in the market. They, they earn about 20, 30,000 per month. And interestingly, this structure reduces the fuel efficiency of, uh, by a of the truck by 20% itself. So that's like 
And if the fuel bill of the truck is 100,000 per month, that's an additional 15, 20,000 worth of money that you're blowing away because of bad aerodynamics. But when we asked people, why wouldn't you change this? We're like, no. Okay. Because what people were doing were they were anthropomorphizing the truck. These are eyes. This is the nose. And this is the turbine. And in regions where they had higher turbines, the turbine would go higher, higher, and higher. And this was, they did this because the trucks were as human as this, themselves, and they were, which, you know, they were competing against each other in terms of who is more dominant. And this is how this truck evolved as iteratively, it evolved very iteratively, and it evolved into it evolved into something which is that behemoth. And it was almost the same as Darwin's theory of evolution, survival of the fittest, evolution, and genetic drift. So when I started uh, engineering and I started my engineering career, I started out as an entrepreneur, and uh, I started making these bikes. You know, I thought they, these were the most functionally efficient bikes ever. Uh, the Land speed record for such a bike is about 140 kilometers per hour. That's very, very fast. They're more ergonomic, they're easier to sit on, and they're more efficient. They didn't sell, so I made another bike. Didn't sell either. Then we made another bike, didn't sell either. I was wondering, I'm making such efficient bikes, and they're so much faster than the normal bikes. Why aren't they selling? And the reason was not because of technological superiority. Things do not sell because of technological superiority. Things sell because they conform to the societal norms. It was very difficult from trans um, for people to accept this bicycle from the ordinary. And the only reason this bicycle succeeded was because women started riding this bicycle and they couldn't ride this bicycle because these, it was about being macho. You know, bicycles were about being macho, being more manly, and being more aggressive. And when it came to the transition from this bicycle to this bicycle, it never was possible because it was too submissive. You know, the seating posture was too submissive, too low down under, and people just didn't want this. By the way, one of the more efficient designs or the more ergonomic designs of bicycle riding is this. But no, please, thank you very much. I won't ride this. So to summary, so to summarize thing, it's not the most superior, beautiful, or technologically advanced technology that succeeds. It's the design that conforms well into the societal norms and the primitive needs of human beings. This is an iconic design, and McDonald's, um, this is one of, probably one of the best logo designs ever. And McDonald's designed it for kids, and they designed it to represent breasts, because they wanted children to think of it as food. And, and throughout history, there's never been a better logo design than this. So point number two, design coherence. Do you think this would sell? Coca-Cola made this mistake. Why not? Because of the green color, because, well, Subway is green, Subway sells. But because the shape, the color of the product, and the color of the logo are saying three different things, and there's no design coherence in that. And the third most important thing, survival and reproduction are the basic ingredients reflected in every mundane design, be it the design of this slight changer that I have in my hand. And all art is bound within that design, you know, within those constraints of life and death. Thank you very much.